It's a great day. Welcome to That's Great IT, your one-stop place to learn about IT ops by turning IT noise into insights and manual tasks into automated actions, powered by Big Panda. I'm your host, Craig Ferrara. Join me as I talk to tech experts and people from different walks of life, sharing great insights, the latest trends, and relevant topics about IT ops and AI ops. This is That's Great IT, powered by Big Panda. And I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the new year. We've got a different format for today's episode, and I'm really excited because we actually have three guest hosts, three returning hosts that have come back amazingly after their first experience to talk a little bit today about the 2023 predictions for IT operations. And we're going to run through a few different topics, everything from changes we think we might see in operating models, what the current economy, the global trend in the economy means for operating budgets, new technologies we might see, and maybe some kind of off-the-wall predictions for 23. But just to get us kicked off here, I'd like to welcome back to the show Mark Swartz, who is the co-founder and co-CEO at QTIS AI. We're also joined by William Connors, once again, the IT director, now for the Noble Group, which is a group that operates hotel brands, casinos, restaurants globally. And we're joined again by Nigel Peacock, who is the factional IT leader at a global charity brand. And so these guys, thank you so much for coming back. It's really great to have you. We covered a lot of different topics in your individual episodes. So I think you guys will bring great perspectives from different sides of the IT industry. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's get ourselves kicked off in our panel discussion here. And what I'll do is, Mark, I'll kick things off with you if that's okay. So 2023, right? We've seen operating models change. And when I say operating models, I'm thinking about we've got technologies and tech stack that drives observability. We've got service desk models where humans are then kind of receiving requests from other humans, but also maybe handling low-level incidents from observability. Let's start off our 2023 predictions talking about operating models. And where do you think we're going here in the next 12 months? Thanks for calling upon me for that. It's a never ending barrage of data, right? So the data never stops and it's only increasing. And I think, I don't know if this is a prediction or if we're talking about predictions, but so we we deal with something called generative AI, right? So it's AI that's just generating data. It's generating data in tabular format or in imagery format for computer vision models and whatnot. What we have seen, and this is very novel, new, right? So within the next probably year or two, you'll see so much more data arriving into the systems from generative platforms that what we're starting to find is that here's a case in point. A downstream report hits a CSO or CXO for some cost center, and there's an anomaly in the value. Well, the value is being generated automatically through a formulation, let's say, but another formula from a legacy system shows up or another outcome from that legacy system that hasn't been stubbed out of the workflows, let's say. So we're starting to see is generative or more of the ML ops, ML orchestration of data causing some downstream effects. So it's hitting people in a real way because they're seeing something that doesn't add up. And we start to call it now the data trust fall. So it's this back propagation of understanding of how that occurred. And we're always on the AI side. So we're the ones saying, trust us first because AI can't be wrong. It's new. It's looking at the data differently perhaps. And so we're getting into these interesting discussions. I'll say that nicely, discussions. <laughs> around where did this come from? How did this originate? And who's right or who's wrong? Which system did this? So So I'll say it's great to hear that humans are still a part of your prediction for 23, given that you're at an AI company. But no, actually, what I'd love, love to do is hand this one over to Nigel. So building on that more data coming through, but also like a, you're getting data that's presenting anomalies that might have previously needed humans involved. You know, Nigel, how do you see that impacting operations if we're just getting more and more proliferation of data? 
You know, it's a good question, okay, because I'm picking up on one thing that Mark said, and I agree fundamentally with all of the points you just made. The one challenge I see is exactly the copious amounts of data and establishing trusted sources with all of that. I mean, I think, Mark, you mentioned, you know, the questions are, well, where did this data come from and what part does it play in the bigger picture? And I think from a human side, and I like to think that at least the last time I looked at it was borderline human in this process, that establishing that trust and providing confident sources of that data is key to the success of AI, certainly within IT operations. Back to the opening question about where the advances may be next year, I firmly believe that AI and automation a key to a number of real world problems that are coming across. And even if I focus on the, the service desk, if you want, there are so many repetitive requests where AI and ML um, can assist. It fits really nicely. I'm such a firm believer in the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, where 80% of the outcomes come from 20% of all of the incidents or the causes, right? So if you can automate those, you're relieving a lot of stress within the service desk, within incident and problem management as well. So yeah, I, I think data, absolutely key to it. And I have one kind of off the wall request about AI, which I will save incidentally as well as so you can put a pin in it. But with that, I think I see it as a stress reliever within service management, but just let's establish where those sources of truth and systems of record are for the copious amounts of data that are coming. That makes a lot of sense. And actually, William, in our previous conversation, we were talking a lot about kind of the service industry and the immediacy of feedback and the amount of data proliferation that's allowed you guys to interact almost in real time with guest experiences, right? So I'm sure... The proliferation of data, like the concept is no stranger to how you have architected your operating models. So how for how are things for you evolving in 2023 from an operating model perspective? Well, the data in the background is actually sounding like it's very complicated, but in reality, it's making the user experience far more easier because all of the data in the background is being pulled together and creating not only an easier interface for the end user, but also too, the end user is able to take this data and it's also going to uh, give uh, personal advertising. When I was listening to uh, Nigel and Mark speak, I was thinking about that movie with Tom Cruise. Uh, Minority Report. Minority Report, yeah. Like uh, where you walk down the street and you've got personalized advertising coming at you from all directions. That, to me, I think is what we're arriving at now. You've got loads and loads of data in the background, but what it is, is you can actually use that data to enhance the person's experience on a personal level. You've got that, and also, too, you've got AI working together. When we spoke last time, we were talking about the kiosks. All of the big businesses for restaurants like McDonald's, Burger King, when you go to a, a kiosk, it'll actually give you a personalized experience and you're like, oh God, how does it remember that I ordered this last time? But it's because all these great engines in the background are making use of this new technology to, to give you a better experience. And also too, it's giving the companies running these software programs a better insight into your tastes. So the trend that I'm hearing here for sure is that our operating models need to be able to respond to even more data. But, and, and I'm not trying to skip around here because one of our topics today is new technologies, but it does sound like technology is starting to be able to meet the needs of that big data because you can't just staff more and more human beings to get the insights that you need. You have to be able to make sense or use of the 2012 term big data, right? That's coming through, but you have to be able to make sense of it and make use of it. So we're seeing in the hospitality industry, William, that this data is able to be utilized. We're seeing that AI is starting to be able to find insights in that data where humans need to be able to, you know, essentially decision against that. But maybe it's finding tidbits and nuggets in that data that a decision is needed against, but might otherwise have been buried if AI ML hadn't been involved. And what I'm also hearing then is that trust becomes a huge component of this because if you start to have these decision-making engines analyzing big data and they are bringing to you some type of insight, you have to trust the insight that's brought to you in order to act upon it. The question that I have, and I'm going to go back around the group then, is 
what does this mean for human operating models? Does it mean that we are able to staff fewer people? Does it mean that we staff more people or maybe in specialized jobs? And maybe, Mark, from a human staffing perspective, maybe I'll start with you to get your perspective on that. My first instinct when you mentioned that was AI will evolve beyond their demand, their need, right? So for all of the inputs that you can gather from a service desk level one, you can create a model around that. So for every answer to every question, you reduce a human staff by maybe a quarter percent per three months. So just a formula off the top of your head, how many of those trouble tickets come in that could be resolved with one single answer that Nigel and William see every day, maybe? And so the point is, is that as the humans are resolving problems, they're going to give feedback into the loop that you can build a model and you no longer need that individual to answer that question. So decision-making will rapidly be evolved into the trust fall, like the data trust fall. So if AI is answering, is it the right answer? Or if it's sending data, is it the accurate data, right? So everybody will have to get through this. And so that's the only, that's my take on human interaction until it becomes the decision-making and the decision has a priority to it that's connected with an SLA, then you're always going to have a human in the middle. So I've been fighting that for five to six years at companies, and they'll never give it up because you right. need it. You need the human decision making because it's too many asymmetrical questions and variables. So, And it takes us back to where does responsibility lie? And I think a, an apt metaphor for this is the self-driving car right? If you truly get rid of the steering wheel and an accident occurs, who's to blame? That's where I think a lot of that fear comes from is there has to be ultimately be someone to take responsibility for the important decisions that are made. And until we get ourselves over that philosophical hump, to your point, there's probably going to be a human in there. Nigel, I mean, so as we trust more and more of the decisions coming out of AIML with all this data coming through, how does this affect your staffing models essentially? So, well, let me first just, can I just add to that point about the self-driving car? Because using that that as a metaphor, I think it depends who you ask, actually. If you were to ask an insurance company, the other person is always to blame, right? So whether that car had a steering wheel or not is somewhat academic in most instances. Now, I'm sure it won't boil down to that very simple answer, if you want, but there's nuance all around is my point with this. Back to the immediate question, Craig, how does this affect resourcing? and and staffing models going forward. Really, to Mark's point, there's an inherent need to have humans involved. And again, I'm going to focus on the service desk if you want. There is an inherent need for it as well. The information that we have at our fingertips through a lot of ITSM platforms is somewhat binary and doesn't necessarily summarize empathy and sympathy, if you want, and more importantly, sentiment. I truly believe and I'm probably I think I'm giving away like the golden the gold <laughs> the golden idea here with this as well. Although you're probably going to tell me it's already been done. But I truly believe that if we could develop a means for AI to synthesize the sentiment of the caller, of the customer, and allow them the resolving agents to tap into that information, it would adjust the way they respond to it. Because it's not always a binary. It's not always, you know, like the IT crowd, turn it off and turn it back on again, right? There's nuance in there. But if you've got either frequent customers to the service desk, or if you've got urgent customers that are service desk now, you could argue that everybody's urgent, but they're really not. They have different levels of urgency depending on the task. If you could somehow synthesize the sentiment that's coming through in the way that they reach out to service operations, I think you'd have the golden ticket. I really do, because it would help. And this, I am really, I mean, at some point, I'm answering your question here by saying that we are going to continue to deal with finite resources in responding to customer service, whether that's internal or external customers. And we've just got to find a way to maximize and make more effective use of the resource that we have available. Um, And again, back to the automation point, but some kind of magical unicorn-like thinking where if a call comes in, it will give some more of a human indication of the state of that caller. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And And William, when you're thinking through the model for supporting global brands, you know, or brands that operate in multiple countries, 
especially as you get requests that might come into a centralized desk from across the globe, right? This proliferation of data that you have available, how has that changed the way you guys are building your teams now and say 12 months from now? One constant, uh, no matter what country we're talking about, I know in the UK especially, there's a severe need of staff. And uh, the staff that uh, are available, they're very demanding and it's sometimes very difficult. If you do not wow them with a great you know, environment, they're not going to stay. And uh, we're actually falling back more and more on technology to actually uh, remove the manual labor in uh, all the tasks. So as you know, in restaurants, we've opened up a lot more kiosks instead of training staff because the staff has become very expensive. The technology in the kiosks, it gives you suggestive ordering. So it'll say, hey, why don't you order this? And you can actually see the same technology to supercharge the servers in the restaurants at a table service. So like uh, before, you would actually pay someone to be a maitre d'. You would pay someone to uh, uh, be a sommelier and uh, figure out the wines. Now you can rely on technology. You can be like, okay, this person just ordered a steak with fettuccine sauce. The person can come back and say, well, actually, based on the data, this Chateau Lafitte uh, 1987 is the perfect wine to have. Before you used to pay someone and train someone to do these tasks, now the technology is strong enough that uh, the person that you're paying like uh, a much lower salary can actually act like they're a maitre d' or act like they're a sommelier. So you can actually take someone with much less training and turbocharge their experience falling back on technology. And what does that mean? So you've got all this technology that's baked into this, we'll say operational roles at the restaurant level. What does that mean for your IT organization? Well, it's great. The budgets for IT is growing, which is very nice for myself, but also it's getting better on all sides. Customers are embracing technology. Five years ago, you never would have had anyone pay with their mobile phone. All of a sudden now it's becoming commonplace. You would have different departments not wanting to include uh, IT in the conversations. Now the technology is becoming uh, the central focal point. So instead of there being like a dedicated marketing division and a dedicated operations division, IT is kind of like getting in their uh, fingers and everything. So I think people are finally realizing that technology is your friend and technology is a channel to improve sales and also to improve business intelligence all around. That's a perfect segue, by the way, thinking about operating budgets and how things are changing. We are not necessarily in a period of rapid growth anymore, but you just mentioned that IT budgets are increasing. And so what I would say is, Mark, are you experiencing the same thing? Are you seeing IT operating budgets increase even as the global economy has cooled off a little bit? I mean, we've seen the Fed raise the rates in unprecedented levels here in the States several times just to battle inflation, right? Are you seeing the same type of growth in operating budgets, even if it's small growth? Well, absolutely. I think the corollaries between what's happening in, we'll call it noise news, right? So sometimes you're, let's say psychosis. So you're not seeing these effects across financial markets completely. So in the real world, two things typically happen if there is such thing as a recession happening, R&D budgets get cut. The majority of our customers that we currently service are in R&D. So we do medical, healthcare, biology, you know, life sciences, and those have not changed whatsoever, but they're growing. IT budgets also are growing because there is the huge demand to deal with everything that's being automated. Automation doesn't mean headcount reduction. It means a shift of capabilities from a person from one place to another. So it's really upscaling sort of what William was saying with sort of the matrix injecting IQ into somebody's head or recommendation capabilities. We're seeing the same thing. We're asking more from people and they just can't do it to some degree. So you need more people. So when you're trying to stretch that capability of a person into new areas. So yes, the budgets are not shrinking by any means. And I think there would be no reason for them to because everybody sees the benefit of what's happening. I'm glad to see that the story is corroborating across different industries, right? AI, ops, software development. We've got global hospitality. Nigel, from the perspective of global charity, for example, are you seeing the same thing in terms of how 
I'm assuming, though, as we, if we see incremental increases in IT operating budget, the expectation for the output of those teams goes up disproportionately. Your team might grow 20%, but you're expected to support 70% greater volume of incidents or technologies. So Nigel, are you seeing the same thing? No, to be honest, and I'll just put my hand up right now. So Mark and William, if you've got budget to spare, hey, look, I'll give you my, I'll give you my mailing address. <laughs> so it, yes, of course, within the .org world, it's always going to be more limited. But even more recently in the commercial world as well, I haven't actually experienced budget expansion. I've seen static budget growth, if you want, but certainly not, um, not expansion. To your point, Craig, about expectations, though, in other words, getting... Uh, what is expected out of what you can provide. I think that's really key. I have witnessed, and I'm going to sound a little bit like an AI naysayer, and I don't mean to be because I'm actually a strong advocate of it. I really am. But I think how the outcomes of AI is managed is key to success and therefore key to how you get the budget to apply to any AI or ML-driven projects that you have. There's still a high degree of magical thinking from certain quarters of a company, if you want. They will come, and I personally have experienced this, and then they'll come to me and say, well, hey, can't AI cure this? And I think, probably, but what's the problem? You know, and you have to ask, what's the problem 50 times before you can really distill it? And I can see Mark nodding at that because I feel that is somewhat endemic as well. Yeah, I'm not seeing expanding budgets. I'm certainly seeing do more with what you have. I tend to see that from Big Panda's perspective as an event processing AI ops platform, right? We tend to see a lot of that narrative as well, which is, you know, maybe there is growth in operating budget. But because we're a vendor, nobody wants to tell us that, <laughs> you know, because they think it's going to translate to things like license fees. But what we are hearing is universally, even if there is increases in, in operating budget, is do more with what you have, right? And I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the AI ML narrative come in. What can this do? How can this help us make decisions faster? How do we shorten ticket durations and things of that nature? Now, one thing I think we've done so far pretty well on this episode is bake in the idea of new technologies and how they're being used, especially in the coming year, not to steer us away from the AI ML conversation, but are there any other technologies in general that we see emerging outside of, say, machine learning or AI-driven data processing? And William, maybe we'll start with you on that. Are you seeing any new technologies in use? Yes, actually. One thing which is very exciting and it addresses the topics we touched upon already today is there's a lot of technologies out there to cut down on credit card costs because that's one of the key things that's uh, going on in our industry. You think that we're spending so much on different things, but when you look at the balance sheet at the end of the day, at least for the industry that I'm in, You'll see that the biggest winners in uh, like no matter all of our efforts are the credit card companies because everyone is paying with credit cards and the credit card fees are enormous. So one area that's been popping up more in retail in the past year is it's called the payment orchestration layer. So what it is, is right now you've got one merchant ID and all of your credit card transactions go through that merchant ID, which goes to the bank. Now, with the payment orchestration layer, you can have five or six different IDs. And then the AI, based on the person's credit card, based on the amount of the transaction, based on a couple of different factors, it'll actually find the cheapest option. And by doing so, you're reducing your credit card spend by about 20%. That's uh, one area that seems to be uh, growing quite exponentially. The other one is, is uh, direct banking, where you basically bypass the credit card transactions altogether. And you're just going directly from the merchant into uh, the consumer's bank account. So you're bypassing credit cards altogether. Now, those fees can be for a small consumer, like maybe uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, dollars. But uh, if you're a big uh, business, you're talking tens of millions of dollars. So uh, I think that's one area where I think it's already permeating into uh, the larger online retailers. And I think it's going to make its way into uh, the smaller businesses as well. Just one follow-up for you. Does that represent a new category of technology that needs to be supported 
by IT operations? Or is it kind of the same discipline as somebody that was managing POS and things like that? Well, I find I'm having to deal with with it and we're trying to get uh, drive our business into that area because we know that we're going to save on the bottom line. I think it's partly IT and partly uh, business analysts. And then, of course, there's a, an additional part to that, and that is the security. So, uh, of course, it's another way of having to protect yourself against fraud in a new area as well. That's interesting. I have not heard of that. I'm very interested. Maybe we'll actually do a follow-up episode to check in on progress on those because that has vast implications for retail, online transactions, brick and mortar. So Mark, going to you then, and trends in AI for sure. And you know, don't limit yourself to talking about AI. I know QTIS is an AI company, but we're all working in technology here. But is AI evolving then in 23 and in such a way as, as someone who might be considered like myself, a lay person when it comes to things like artificial intelligence? Are there any new categories within the technology or new technologies emerging from that side of the market that we should be looking out for in 23? Yeah. So Nigel, you said you're a bear on AI, but you nodded 67% of the time. <laughs> so, just joking. Contradictions, I offer, Mark. <laughs> exactly. So you're clearly going to be okayed by the AI gods then. I, just to follow up your prior point, Craig, about the budgets and the decisions around headcount, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Think about it from the perspective of the corporations. They have a choice to ask staff to evolve up, right? Learn more to solve more, right? Or they can buy an AI system because something to Nigel's point, and probably William has heard this a lot, is that there's a black box somewhere that solves everything. And and we get calls all day about this. Can it, can't it just do this? Can't it just do that? Because we see amazing pictures on the internet. We see amazing news stories. So doesn't it solve that yet? And so you get a lot of this sort of, I don't know what you call it, but this fantasy that it does everything. And then you get down to the scope of work. You get down to the real question of the problem. And then it breaks out into a year project. So a lot of that misconception of what AI can do It can chat with you. It can answer things incorrectly still. It cannot give you the sentiment response that it should give you because it can't analyze accurately the tonality of the voice or whatnot. But there's a lot of promise there. But I think the answer is that people will opt and are starting to opt to choose the black box over a person. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to summarize and say. So that mindset will continue until they just shift and decide to go back with humanity. But on the future thinking side, yeah, there is, there, there's a lot of interesting things happening. And one that we see that's quite interesting that could be boring are clinicals. Clinical trials take approximately four years to operate mm-hmm. and they're very costly. They're in the, t- the tens and twenties of millions of dollars to operate. And this is human-based studies outside of life sciences. Many corporations run human-based studies and there's a lot of advancement. There's been a promise for over 10 years to do decentralized studies to lower the cost by 50%, which never happened. They can't get blood lab results. They can't get sensory readings. They can't do telemedicine correctly. So this is coming, this, there's an AI shift now that's starting and probably within the end, by the beginning of 2024, they will heavily automate that through computer vision and other sensory systems that are now available. And so we see that as a huge technology shift, specifically around the decrease of cost of some pharmaceuticals, not all, because they won't pass that cost savings on to everybody. Mm -hmm. But in some countries who are going to widely adopt this, and they do have more open clinical data studies, a very rapid response of outcomes to medicines, pharmaceuticals, things like that. So new therapeutics, much faster. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's the only interesting thing other than around beauty and skincare I can tell you about. (laughs) Well, I mean... We all have our nightly regimens. So, you know, when you are able to talk about that stuff, we'll do another episode. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm just not well equipped at it because every time I get on the calls to discuss it, it's just I get analytical and everybody's talking about something different about contouring. And I have no idea really what that means. But it's quite it's quite interesting. There's a really large shift coming, believe it or not, on the consumer side for that space. But it's probably not so interesting for all of us. (laughs) Fair, fair. 
Well, Nigel, how about you? What type of new technologies are you looking forward to or would you like to see in 23 that would certainly help an operating budget who apparently on this call is the only one that's maybe not increasing? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in a Dickensian Christmas at the moment. <clears throat> so I'm not sure what I'm looking towards is new technology per se, but I'd like to see enhancements in growing technology. And, and an example, if you want, and again, I'm focusing around service management and the service desk, if you want. There are a few platforms available at the moment which provide service desks, even change management, and or in fact, all of the ITIL processes with a very holistic view of an environment. There's a proliferation and growing in most organizations of devices, users, platforms, et cetera. And very often it presents a very fragmented view of, say, a user footprint out there. But there are some great platforms up and coming at the moment, which via discovery and there are AI elements in there, actually provide a much more holistic view of an element, whether that is a user, whether that is an end user device or a platform as well. Now, the benefit of that is huge to resolving agents. Anyone out there on L1 and L2, they want to see everything that's impacted by an incident that may come across their desk. And without these platforms, it's very much a kind of a, a peck and sniff as they go hunting around the world trying to find out all of those impacts and effects. With these platforms, and I'm not going to name drop incidentally, but there's a couple that, that spring to mind. With these platforms, no, screw it, I'll name drop anyway, with Productive and Axonius as well, which are my favorite ones, they actually do that. They give you a one-stop shop, which means that the resolving time, the time spent on those incidents is vastly reduced, at least from the research perspective, a growth in those particular areas, actually. So I think... As a surprise to no one, in our 23 predictions, I'm hearing a couple of things. I'm setting us up so we can now talk about our weird off-the-wall predictions for 23. My, my weird off-the-wall prediction for 23 is that in my personal life playing soccer, I will probably suffer a major injury. It's just, it's periodic and I'm well overdue for some sort of ankle roll, but that's not related to IT operations. So far today, though... I say this as on camera, I'm holding up a broken finger from a previous issue. Nobody on the podcast can see it, but as we record this, everybody else can. But um, what we're hearing today, a lot of technologies allowing for immediate data to be gained from the system, from the field, from our operations, right? We're getting tons of data. We're seeing that data, a role for AI ML interpreting the data and getting really just immediate insights about what's happening and what we're seeing, and that we need to be able to trust this. And I, I think that would come as a surprise to almost no one thinking about the predictions for 2023. There's lots more data. You know, your budget may go up. Maybe it doesn't go up, but you're going to be expected to do more. And one of the keys to get there is utilizing AIML to get there as well. So what I want to do, let's wrap, we'll, we'll round out the episode. We've already heard my prediction for 23, but it's not related to IT operations. But let me go around the room and, and William, I'll start with you. Is there any off the wall predictions that you think we might see that maybe we haven't discussed today? Everyone is going to be expected to make more with less. And there's no better example than technology where You'll have less people doing uninteresting manual tasks, and you'll have more people in much more data-driven service-type roles, which will improve the customer experience, and less people uh, basically uh, punching numbers into a box. It's actually, in the whole scheme of things, better for all of humanity. Yeah, I think so too. And you'll see people job satisfaction go up if they're doing more interesting thought driven things. You'll see better retention rates come out of that. I'm very glad to hear that sort of thing. Mark, let's go to you next. I am guessing this is a guess, but I'm going to think that people of all positions within a company will be asked to join meetings that they thought they were never supposed to join. And they will not know why they're there. <laughs> And my point being is they're asked because there is an inability for AI to gather all the data because we all trusted ETIL, right? We all heard data silos, data lakes, data oceans, corollaries can't happen. So we process petabytes of data and we can't find corollaries across some silos that are just a $2 billion company. 
So I really believe the only way to capture and solve that will come down from the McKenzie's and all the big consultancies to get people cross-pollinated in meetings. And the people who are going to be pulled into these calls are level one, level two, and level three service desk people because they hear all the problems and you want to solve problems. And somebody will be sitting in the corner taking notes and drafting a decision matrix as to how these could be resolved faster. And that will go feed into a future model. So specifically that, around a company. That is another prediction I'm excited for. Again, it, it comes down to a greater focus on the operators that are supporting IT, right? And allowing them to be creative thinking individuals who have a voice. Yep. Nigel, round us out here. What's, what's one of your off the wall predictions for 23? So I'm going to be a little provocative, perhaps, although I really occupy the center of this debate. But I think there's going to be a reckoning about managed service providers. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it start right now. And the opposite end of this reckoning, there are two very polar trains of thought. One from companies that engage with MSPs in that an MSP is going to come in and provide the golden fleece, the answer to all of their issues and magically solve it with very little input or management from the customer. Two is the opposite end as an MSP that they have often come into an organization with what they believe the organization to need and structure a solution around that. And it very often doesn't turn out to be what the customer asked for. Now, these are not unique problems, but I'm seeing them frequently and often. I'm not actually even thinking of my current engagement. The, the day of reckoning, I believe, will come when customers of MSPs understand that an MSP needs to be managed and needs to be given direction and clear objectives. And the MSPs, in turn, understand that they really need to go beyond just a work order when they get into an engagement and truly understand the customer's needs. And I think once those two narrow in that gap, there will continue to be a very strong market for MSPs and a need. And maybe some customers will realize that they need to step up on the way that they manage the MSP and, in turn, gain efficiencies and cost savings because of that as well. So I'm seeing it both ends. I think you just signed yourself up for a season two podcast on the topic because <laughs> it came out of left field talking about MSPs, but that's a great prediction. And I see that all the time, especially when you get licenses that are made up of, you know, hey, the volume of incidents or tickets that we handle on your behalf is how we charge, right? Right. You get an MSP that suddenly becomes this blocker to innovation, right? Because anything that reduces noise, reduces tickets, affects their license cost. And remember, to your point, they came in and said, no, send us everything. We're here to solve it all, right? But when you start to introduce automation and efficiency and AI, and suddenly the data and insights that are coming out of that are much more in your control and part of your design, that means that your MSPs need to be a part of that formula as well. So that's a great prediction. And I've made a note of that. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on that, because I think it's one that deserves a lot more conversation. But for now, and guys, I want to say thank you so much for joining our 23 predictions, 2023, how everything is evolving. We hope that this becomes kind of an annual thing. Hopefully next year we'll be doing 2024. But for those of us who have made it to the end of the episode here, I'd like to thank William Connors, Mark Swartz, and Nigel Peacock for joining us in our 2023 predictions. And we look forward to seeing everybody here in the new year, in the rest of the uh, That's Great IT episodes. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Greg. That was great. Thanks everyone for tuning in. This has been That's Great IT, your one-stop place to learn about IT ops and AI ops powered by Big Panda. Catch us on our next episode. <laughs>